adultery, how much pain and suffering there is in this word. Each person goes through it differently. Someone has enough of their own strength, and someone needs the help and support of the environment. Gentlemen, this is one of the stories of adultery. The husband finds out that his wife is cheating, and it is possible that this betrayal has been going on for a very long time. Well, let's hear this story. I am 47 years old, my wife is 45 years old. We have been happily married for 22 years and are proud parents of three children. Our eldest is a 20-year-old son, as well as two charming girls of 18 and 16 years old. But on September 11, 2001, a terrible event happened. On this day, my wife arranged a meeting with a man she met on the internet in a nearby hotel room. It was obvious that they intended to have an affair. Prior to this meeting, they had been exchanging text messages and photos for several months. At that time, we had been married for only two years, and our son was not even a year old yet. It's hard to believe how it was then. Surprisingly, the only reason my wife didn't carry out her plans was the tragic attack on the World Trade Center. Her uncle was on the 84th floor of the South Tower, and it was almost obvious that he died instantly in the fall. As we remember, the whole country was in mourning, and my wife took this news especially hard. I couldn't help but sympathize with her and was there to comfort and support her during this difficult time. Overcome by uncertainty and remorse, my wife could no longer bear the weight of her guilt. She plucked up the courage and confessed her previous intentions to me, expressing deep regret and changing her mind. She sincerely apologized and even provided evidence that their relationship did not go beyond the emotional stage, assuring me that they did not cross physical boundaries. Before her confession, I had a vague feeling that something was wrong, but I didn't even suspect that she was having an emotional affair. This revelation shocked me very much because I thought it was true. My wife was not one of those from whom such behavior could be expected. She had a special upbringing where parties, drinking, and dating were strictly forbidden. She often felt that she had missed this experience when we were just starting our relationship. She confessed to me that I was the first person with whom she had a romantic relationship. After her confession on September 11th, I began to doubt everything I thought I knew about my wife up to this point. I sincerely believed her when she said that I was her first and only romantic partner, but her willingness to agree to a meeting with a man she met online at a cheap motel made me doubt what else she could hide from me. If it wasn't for the tragedy that happened, she could have carried out her plan, and I wouldn't have guessed anything. I must admit that her decision to tell everything on her own initiative played a role in the fact that I am ready to consider the possibility of reconciliation, but I made it clear to her that contacting a psychologist is a prerequisite for moving forward. Despite this, I have not seen any concrete evidence that she actually took steps to solve the problems that led her to such actions. The betrayal associated with treason remained in my memory, a painful experience that destroyed my world. At that time, our son was still in infancy, and a man I trusted completely destroyed him because of a mistaken sense of self-pity. But following our agreement, she turned to a psychologist, expressed sincere remorse, and took the necessary steps to restore our relationship. Although it took a long time, the intensity of the pain gradually subsided, turning into a distant memory. And yet, trust is like a thin thread. Having collapsed, it becomes fragile and requires huge efforts to restore. Imagine a sheet of clean white paper just taken out of the package. It radiates pristine purity and elegance. But when a spot of infidelity appears on the paper, it deforms its once smooth surface, crumples into a ball. Despite all our efforts to smooth it out, it will never be able to fully restore its original purity and novelty, as well as the trust that has been damaged after that painful incident. I still have doubts about my wife. Even as our reconciliation went on and we worked to restore our relationship, I was still forced to conduct my own checks to make sure of it. Surprisingly, she passed these checks, proving her willingness to return my trust. I think it's a testament to her efforts and the progress we've made together. And although we managed to smooth out the rough edges, our trust has never been the same. Years have passed since that painful incident, and during this time, two more beautiful children have appeared in our lives. But on October 14, 2019, a familiar instinctive feeling made itself felt again, and I couldn't help but despise the anxiety it caused. Intuition is never pleasant, especially when it calls into question the stability of our relationship. 
One Monday morning, the tension in the relationship increased when our eldest daughter, 18 years old, got into a heated argument with my wife before going to school. Later, I made a mistake and decided to defuse the situation by playing with the family dog, which caused our daughter to burst out laughing. Despite his innocent intentions, my wife's reaction was unexpected. Overwhelmed with strong emotions, my wife looked upset and withdrawn. To my surprise, the first alarm signal was her decision to disable the location data exchange function on her phone, with which the whole family tracked each other's location. This sudden change in behavior caused an instinctive feeling of anxiety in me. The trust that we had been restoring with such difficulty needed additional nourishment. Driven by the desire to check and make sure, I was looking for ways to access her phone, computer, and any other devices that could help sort out the situation. My actions were dictated by the desire to gain clarity and confidence in a situation where I was faced with the alarming possibility that our relationship was again seriously tested. Today, we had to accompany the youngest to the post office to get a passport for the upcoming school trip. Since my wife works at the school where my daughter studies, she kindly offered to take her there, and I met them at the specified place. It was necessary for both of us to be present at the execution of this assignment, but throughout all this time, she looked somehow detached and closed. While we were waiting, there was an alarming silence in the cabin, interrupted only by periodic absences to talk on the phone. It was obvious that she was engaged in correspondence with someone, which caused an annoying thought in my head, a desire to take the phone and conduct further proceedings. She usually left her phone unattended in the house, but lately, she started carrying it with her wherever she went. This unexpected change dealt another blow to my feelings. In addition, I remembered the recent purchase of an iPad for her workplace, which I diligently set up. We have repeatedly discussed this acquisition, so her desire did not come as a surprise. In addition to the phone, the iPad became her constant companion, which she carried around the house. At some point, she left it unattended on the table, which gave me the opportunity to investigate further. But to my surprise, I found that she had blocked it with a code. This was unusual for us, as we usually don't use codes on our devices. She explained this by the fact that confidential information about students is stored on the iPad, which, in my opinion, is quite logical. However, there was still the possibility that she had used it for other purposes. On Friday, we agreed to meet at the bank to finalize the closing of the loan for the purchase of housing. We returned home with the intention of taking care of the house, but she said she had an errand to run. Curious, I decided to check our checking account and found out that one of her errands was to visit an adult store to make some purchases. This event immediately aroused my suspicions. When I had the opportunity, I discreetly searched for the things she had purchased. To my surprise, I came across beautiful underwear. Our intimate life was stagnant and practically non-existent, primarily due to her lack of desire. This discovery was the reason for our conversation. Annoyed by the lack of intimacy in our relationship, I decided to consult a doctor on this issue. During the search, I came across several sites that provided information on the topic of low libido in women. This discovery sparked my curiosity and prompted me to dig deeper. I tried to follow her actions unnoticed and in the end, managed to find out the access code to her iPad when she was walking with our daughter. With caution and determination, I went to the device, and a Facebook message from a stranger caught my attention. The man asked her to send a photo. Strangely, the app showed that they are not friends on Facebook, which left me perplexed. Perhaps it was just a random person, but her reaction indicated that she was familiar with this person. The conversation quickly turned into a frank form, and when he suggested that she leave our daughter and join him, instead of withholding this information and its source for a clearer understanding, I made an impulsive decision to come into conflict with her that evening. Unfortunately, this turned out to be a big mistake, as she lied about it and took immediate action. The affair remained hidden from prying eyes. She insisted that the underwear was meant for us and that she was trying to muster up the courage to put it on for me. He claimed that the person on Facebook was her former colleague from a summer job who suddenly started texting her. She swore that their communication was limited only to correspondence and did not involve any physical contact. Although I wanted to believe her, I found it difficult to accept her explanations. I made it clear to her that all this should be stopped immediately and completely, and she readily agreed. The next day, I asked if the affair was really over, and she assured me that it was. 
She didn't know that I had accessed the correspondence between her and another person using alternative methods. I found out that she informed him about the need to remove him from Facebook due to my demands, which meant that she lied to me. And here I am, 19 years later, facing a situation that seems all too familiar to me. At this moment, my emotions are in a mess, confused and bewildered. My appetite has decreased, sleep is eluding me, and my ability to concentrate has decreased significantly. Trying to cope with the situation, I scheduled consultations for myself at the end of this week and began to devote more time to the gym. The situation is incredibly painful, and I don't want to face it. Since the day I found out the truth, I've been reading Psalm 81 almost daily. At first, for several days, I managed to cope with the situation relatively well, but today it was especially difficult. I barely slept last night, which made my emotional turmoil worse. As for the bright moments, our son, who was born before the first novel, made us a surprise by giving us tickets to one event. He is currently working in one of the nearby theaters, and we were pleased to attend the play Come From Away. We decided to pretend that we were happy because it was an unexpected gift from him. In his early 20s, he is really an extraordinary person, and we decided not to upset him with a refusal or lack of enthusiasm. If you are not familiar with the production, then it is based on the events of the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attack. It's worth noting that the date is historically significant, as are the feelings I had when we bought the tickets. Constant reminders of that particular date and time, as well as a recently reopened painful wound, prevented me from fully immersing myself in what was happening. Under different circumstances, in a different environment, I might have found pleasure in today's walk. But from the very beginning, I wanted to be anywhere but in this theater. To relieve the discomfort, I began to document my observations, writing down dates, times, and my thoughts in a diary. I've even developed a personal mantra that helps me cope with similar situations. Keep cool, keep patient, keep control. Admittedly, I understand that I need to be more consistent in applying this mantra, but I am diligently working on it. I have made significant progress in improving my thinking. Now, as we prepare for the evening shopping, I am determined to completely change my attitude to what is happening. As a result of the investigation, it turned out that her communication with other men took place within the framework of the summer school program where she worked as a teacher's assistant. It was during this program that she had a connection with a physical education teacher who turned out to be 32 years old. Meanwhile, my wife, who behaved inappropriately, is 47 years old. This situation can be described as entering the role of a cougar. It turned out that the partner is a physical education teacher working at a nearby school, and my wife is at another school, not even in the same area. The wayward wife crossed paths with him during their joint participation in the summer school program. It is worth noting that our local summer school program accepts applications from teachers and staff from different districts who show interest in participating in it. Such a unique organization allows people with different levels of education to work together who otherwise would never cooperate. I found out that he would be present in this program, but I preferred to keep this knowledge to myself. At the moment, she continues to remain in the dark about my awareness. I decided to pay closer attention to this situation and began to observe their communication. Eventually, I came across a message from her to him on Facebook containing very intrusive information. But to my surprise, he seemed to brush her off, which made me grin. This led me to think that he perceives her more as a friend and wants to avoid a romantic relationship. After all, there is a significant age difference between them. She's 47, about 15 years older than him. My belief is based on previous messages in which she mentioned that she was going camping overnight, and he did not answer her. I later found out that she had informed him about this trip. We had a few conversations in a family setting, but she didn't seem to take my point of view. However, I have not yet reached a final decision, although I feel that it is already close. Considering the upcoming significant changes in life, I consider it necessary to have a well-established network of information sources. To do this, I use tools such as voice recorders, GPS navigators, electronic codes, and so on. My goal is to gather as much concrete evidence as possible before taking any drastic steps. In addition, I diligently study and write down the divorce laws in force in my state. Over time, I will turn to legal professionals for advice and help. I turn to several friends who had recently gone through a divorce for advice and recommendations. 
their opinion will undoubtedly prove useful in this difficult situation. In addition, I made a conscious decision to take DNA samples from my three children, not out of doubt but solely for my own peace of mind. Regardless of the results, my love for them remains unchanged. As for what I'm waiting for, it's a combination of gathering enough evidence and having the courage to acknowledge the reality of our situation. The realization that our relationship is irreparable is becoming more and more obvious, and I know that I have to face it head on. Facing the harsh reality remains a difficult task, and I still do not find the strength to confront it directly. In addition, I cannot help but feel a deep reluctance to expose my children, despite their older age, to the turmoil of divorce. Their well-being and emotional stability are of great importance to me, and I do not dare to expose them to the difficulties and uncertainties associated with such serious changes in life. Until the situation becomes completely clear, I am in a peculiar position where some part of me gets some painful pleasure from listening to her conversations recorded on a dictaphone. This gives me the opportunity to learn about recent events, for example, about her recent decision to remove a lot of people from friends over the past couple of days. Yes, I admit that I was spying in this regard, which of course upset her. I am well aware that my actions will not be perceived positively, but it's important to note that for the last year or so, she's been going through what I can characterize as a midlife crisis. She also lost her mother in November, greatly affecting her emotional state and aggravating the already difficult circumstances in which we found ourselves. Just two days after her mother's death, we tragically lost my father. Within three weeks, two more relatives left us. And so, in the midst of all this grief, Christmas came. A whole series of misfortunes has befallen our family, as a result of which we have experienced immense grief. I fully understand how deeply these losses have affected her. Somewhere deep inside me, a thought lurked, perhaps her current state of mind is the result of these recent events, and maybe I should try to create some distance between the pain caused by these losses and the additional mental anguish that a divorce will bring. I guess I'm willing to make that sacrifice in order to give preference to the well-being of my children and other loved ones. I made the difficult decision to be patient a little longer before making hasty decisions. This is not an easy task because ending a relationship that lasted 26 years is far from easy, especially when you consider the enormous love that I felt for this woman throughout most of our marriage, a love that was often all-consuming. I can't deny the power of these feelings. I am currently planning to devote this week to finding divorce lawyers, but I'm also aware that my daughter will have a birthday next Sunday. So, I decided to meet her after this event has passed. Although I'm not sure exactly what words I'm going to use, I intend to let her know that I'm actively looking for a lawyer. By this time, I hope to find a suitable lawyer and be ready to start the divorce process. Although I hope that there will be a moment of awareness and reflection on her part, I have reached the point where I do not want to continue our marriage. I have gathered strong evidence that she has had an extramarital affair. On February 11, 2022, I quietly installed a voice recorder in her car. Interestingly, listening to recorded conversations, I begin to understand the full depth of what happened. After the incident, I immediately decided to mentally prepare for the possible consequences that may soon manifest themselves. To combat insomnia, I decided to use insomnia pills to achieve restful sleep. In addition, I decided to channel all the nervous and uncontrolled energy in the right direction by returning to the gym. As for the lack of appetite, my goal is to lose a few extra pounds that I gained during the absence of training. To solve problems with concentration, I made it a rule to diligently write down important information and mentally repeat the exact order of actions when performing ordinary tasks that I might have forgotten. Finally, I am tormented by night sweats, for which I am actively looking for remedies. When I came across these events, I immediately realized, oh yes, this is another aspect that needs to be dealt with. I quickly took action. I collected some towels, t-shirts, and underwear and put them in a pile next to the bed. I assumed that these things would be especially difficult to handle, especially during the cold winter months. After such an initial reaction, I was overcome with a sense of relief. No longer will I have to constantly fight for secrecy, as if playing the role of spies or investigators in our own marriage. I will no longer be tormented by the need to tiptoe around sensitive topics so as not to upset her, even before I have had time to express my concerns. I understood that in recent months she treated our life as if everything was fine, and this only aggravated her frustration when I finally told her everything. 
Receiving a box of the deceased mother's belongings from her father was an important moment, but I was surprisingly unaffected by this event. Watching her experience during our subsequent skirmish caused me neither sympathy, nor sorrow, nor sadness. After persistent persuasion and prodding, she finally asked, What happened? Tell me what's bothering you. I just mentioned his name. I noticed how excited she was before she ran out of the house. At that moment, a weight fell off my shoulders. I no longer worried about her presence and did not feel tense, as if I had to meet certain expectations or constantly inform her about my affairs. As for the recent events, it seemed to me that something was wrong. Everything was going too smoothly for us, almost unnaturally. Her unexpected kindness towards me aroused suspicion. I noticed an unusual change in her behavior, things that usually annoyed her suddenly stopped annoying her. At first, I regarded it as a sign of her new happiness but some unpleasant feeling seized me, and I decided to take on the role of a vigilant observer. Wearing metaphorical black sunglasses and a raincoat, I turned into a marriage police, imperceptibly installing the voice recorder in her car and activating the GPS navigation system. Throwing a metaphorical fishing rod, I was amazed that I caught something on the first attempt. The recording contained two phone calls, the first of which indicated her intention to meet with him. Their meeting took place in the parking lot of the church and lasted about 40 minutes. Fortunately, I was spared the need to listen to how they communicated while she walked to his car. She made a subsequent phone call to a reliable friend living on the other side of the country, who served as her think tank. If talking to him wasn't enough to confirm my suspicions, and I have no doubt about it, I could find additional evidence in this call. But if I really wanted to remain in the dark, then her call to him would be decisive. The subsequent conversation between us followed a familiar pattern characteristic of her. She tried to downplay or deny her involvement in the betrayal, shifting the blame to another. It's my mistake that she harbored a grudge about missed opportunities in her life before her marriage. She didn't have the opportunity to go to college or lead a carefree bachelor life. Unfortunately, I take responsibility for this, and she resents me. I have already told her that if she wants to end our relationship, I will understand her, but she decided to stay, thereby making it clear that her betrayal is solely her own choice. Although I admit my shortcomings as a husband, it is important to note that I was not married to a perfect man. The idea that I have an ideal wife seems undeserved. In my case, as a result, I turn to divorced women I know for recommendations from lawyers and strategic advice. I've come to the realization that it's time to put an end to this. My wife who retreated from our relationship, demonstrated that she does not have the necessary obligations for reconciliation. I don't want to expose myself to the risk that we may have another betrayal in the future. That's why I'm deciding on a divorce. Are there any special tips or techniques that I should familiarize myself with in this process? I'm still in a whirlwind of emotions. In a moment of acute disappointment, I impulsively hit the wall with my fist, fortunately causing no harm to myself or the building. In the confined space of an empty house, I pour out my pent-up feelings, shouting a swear word at the top of my voice. I am grateful that there was no one in the house who could have witnessed this outbreak. When my best friend called to check on me, I couldn't hold back the tears and burst into tears during our phone conversation. Being in a vulnerable state, I began to dream of a wonderful reconciliation. I hope that everything will magically fall into place in my relationship with my wife. I wondered if it would really be so terrible if we managed to save our relationship. Perhaps if I put more effort into it, she will find happiness. But deep down, I understand that these thoughts are just false hopes, and that divorce is the right way. I have repeated this to my mother, to friends I have confided in, and to myself countless times since the betrayal became known. We mostly avoided each other, and at these moments, I was acutely aware of her absence. Changing our dynamic has been incredibly difficult. We used to exchange text messages during the day when we were at work, find out how our day went, share information during breaks. She would call me, and we would have light conversations. Casual hugs and kisses were commonplace. But now that we're back home, it's all stopped. As already mentioned, we actively avoid each other within our home. Instead of sleeping in our bed, she started sleeping on the couch. Previously, one of my simple joys in the morning was to gently wake her up when the alarm clock rang. I rolled over on my back, stroked her back or arm, and whispered softly, Hey honey, it's time. 
Unfortunately, these intimate moments are a thing of the past. Every morning, I woke her up with a gentle touch and then with an almost inaudible whisper, which never ceased to bring a smile to my face despite the circumstances. She still hasn't left, and we haven't officially parted, but deep down, I understand what needs to be done. Although I know that it will not be an easy path, I find solace in the hope that a glimmer of light awaits me at the end of this long, dark, and lonely tunnel. It is unpleasant to observe her jealousy of our children, who have the opportunity to travel and participate in interesting events thanks to their participation in the school musical group. It is important to note that neither she nor I had the opportunity to experience these opportunities for ourselves. I find joy in watching the happiness of my children and the opportunities they have had, but which I did not have. Over the past two decades, I have devoted my time to participating in a fairly popular local band, which has allowed me to perform at some wonderful events. But my wife is jealous of these opportunities. She denies the countless hours of practice and study that I have spent trying to reach the level that allows me to pursue this hobby. Interestingly, she often shares stories with me about people she encountered at work who heard or followed our music. It seems that she is proud to be married to a man who attracts attention. One day, my wife expressed her displeasure, saying that I leave her alone with the children when I go to play. But it is important to note that I worked and returned home with earnings in my pocket. And while I enjoyed my time, there's no denying that performing music in front of an audience can be incredibly exciting. I had to deal with the need to conduct concerts, communicate with the owners of bars, ensure an impeccable rhythm, and gauge the audience's reaction. Despite the fatigue that performances bring until late at night, I still woke up at 5 in the morning to work a full day. The combination of these duties made the day difficult and long, but it was necessary because we needed the income to build the house she wanted to build. Leaving the band was not an acceptable option, as it was a significant source of income for me. It is worth noting that she also had her own job, but the earnings that I received from performances were comparable to what she earned from her permanent job. In addition, this situation infuriated her, and it turned out that my real job was paid three to four times higher than hers. Having decided to provide my family with the life that, in my opinion, it deserves, I worked tirelessly on this. But instead of gratitude, I received only resentment. The age-old proverb when a person reveals his essence, believe him the first time turned out to be true in my case. Unfortunately, it took me too long to understand the true character of the man I married. As a result, I came to the same conclusion, if we continue to stay together, then I will, in fact, subscribe to another cycle of frustration and dissatisfaction. In this regard, I have collected recommendations for several lawyers and will make an appointment with them in the near future. Unfortunately, I don't see an acceptable solution or future for our relationship. Divorce may not be the immediate outcome, but it has become obvious that there is no basis for salvation in our relationship. Paradoxically, those who know her outside of our home perceive her as a wonderful person, a warm, caring, exceptional mother who constantly helps others. And I can confirm that she really performs these functions. But within her family, reality is different from perception. She embodies the features that I described earlier. She seems to have succumbed to what I call the POM syndrome. This person is her colleague, who, as it turned out, is married to another colleague. I haven't shared this information with her family yet. As far as I know, her father and his sister are the only relatives she has left. Although I don't talk to them very often, I intend to tell her father about it at some point. I also turned to the wife of the man who betrayed us, but unfortunately, she did not respond. If I don't get a response, I will send another email in a couple of days with more details, and then I will respect her decision if she decides not to enter into a further relationship. Tonight, I plucked up the courage and expressed to my wife my desire for a divorce. Although she craved hugs and tears, those moments of intimacy were in the past. Fortunately, she understood the gravity of the situation. We started a bittersweet conversation, remembering how we would like the circumstances to be different. I plucked up the courage and asked her a difficult question, did you not assume that such an outcome was inevitable when you made this choice? She admitted that she was aware but at the same time remained deeply upset. It pains me to watch her suffering. Despite my deep love for this woman, I came to the realization that I could no longer maintain a relationship with her. This is a decision that I would not like to make, but that needs to be made. In the future, 
I think I will find solace in the realization that I am no longer connected to her. Our band is currently on hiatus, but I'm actively looking for other musical opportunities. I participate in projects related to playing the trumpet, specializing in classic rock with an admixture of brass, such as Chicago and similar bands. I firmly look forward to the day when the difficult path I am following will lead me to a place of strength and stability. Although I recognize that there are difficulties ahead of me, I am confident in my ability to overcome them and come out of this state in a positive manner. Although she expressed a desire to consider the possibility of reconciliation through consultations, I resolutely closed this topic. Although I recommended that she seek counseling for her own well-being, at the moment, the only aspect for which I consider myself responsible is that I did not end the relationship earlier. I haven't committed any other misdemeanors in recent years, on the contrary, I tried to be the embodiment of a devoted husband, prioritizing her as the most important person in my life. And so, despite all my efforts, I found myself in this situation again. I am often visited by contradictory thoughts, that I want to save my marriage, and then I am reminded of the reasons why this is no longer possible. This sad feeling reinforces my willingness to let go of the situation. Despite contacting another spouse who betrayed me by email, I did not receive a response. On advice from another source, I plucked up the courage and called her to break the news. I've never felt so terrible in my life. Although I know I didn't do anything wrong by sharing with her the truth that she needed to know, watching her heartache, I felt responsible for her suffering. It was like I was reliving the shock and devastation of breaking someone's heart, even unintentionally. In addition, I assured her that even though we had never met in person, I would be there for her. She can contact me by phone or SMS at any time. In fact, our conversation turned out to be useful for me as well. After discussing our experiences, I got a clearer picture of the situation. Recently, we talked on the phone with her, and now I feel more at ease telling the truth. She expressed her gratitude to me, and this convinces me that I made the right decision. Despite the complexity of the conversation, I was genuinely interested to find out her point of view on his behavior. It seems that she could have fabricated a story about an unhappy marriage in order to gain sympathy and establish a closer connection with her. Although I acknowledge her involvement in this situation, it is possible that she manipulated him by hearing what she wanted in order to fulfill his own desires. My wife is still unaware of the situation. I rebuffed a man who participated in treason, as a result of which two families were destroyed and six children were left wondering how their parents could cause them such pain. Perhaps a simple comparison of salaries would shed light on the situation, but unfortunately, it did not occur to me at the moment. I have stopped communicating with her. I try not to be in the same room with her if it's not related to our children or household duties. Recently, there has been a noticeable coldness in our house. It seems that she is gradually coming to realize that she has crossed the line. I take steps to protect myself. I turn to lawyers, seek support from friends and plan to leave. It seems that she still does not fully realize the seriousness of the situation. To distance myself from her, I limit our communication to such important topics as home, children, and finances. I prefer not to share a room with her. She gradually begins to understand the seriousness of the situation. She seems to expect me to ignore what happened or make a desperate attempt to save our relationship, but in the past, I have not been able to declare my needs and desire to stay together. Content with apologies and minimal changes, I apologize for my previous passivity, but now I intend to use a different approach. I completely change my behavior and refrain from casual conversations and small talk with her. I no longer engage in casual conversations and don't ask how her day went, none of this is happening anymore. She seems to have a hard time coming to terms with my decision to abandon various aspects of our relationship. Instead of taking responsibility for her actions, she prefers to pose as a victim. Watching this is quite unpleasant. She doesn't understand that the blame for the problems in her marriage lies solely on her shoulders. I realize that I might never get an answer to the question why. The question why remains, despite all the difficulties. Tonight was positive. We spent time with the whole family attending an event dedicated to my youngest daughter. My daughter performed amazingly in the school musical. She had a significant role and gave an impressive performance. It was very nice to watch her sing, dance, and enjoy every moment on stage. During the performance, my wife sat next to my mother, 
who is aware of the situation between us. Although my wife doesn't know anything about what my mother knows, I couldn't help but feel sorry for my mom, as she must have been in an awkward position. When I finally told my mom the truth, she was genuinely shocked. She noted that we were always happy together and that she sincerely loved my wife like her own daughter. Another survivor of the betrayal contacted me by text message during the performance, expressing concern about how I was holding up. A husband who had strayed from the path of fidelity was temporarily banished from home by another wife. However, she discovered that he was seeking refuge with a friend who, as it turned out, was absent. This made her worry about possible inappropriate behavior. I was relieved to convince her that her fears were groundless. However, I am also tormented by painful memories and obsessive thoughts. Despite the fact that I hope for reconciliation and the opportunity to fix our relationship, I am increasingly convinced that divorce is the most acceptable option. I understand that given the circumstances, this may seem premature or uncertain, but the idea of continuing the relationship seems completely untenable to me. The only acceptable scenario at the moment seems to be a divorce. Despite my periodic desire to fix our ruined life and family and move on, these moments of nostalgia and hope are fleeting. They serve as part of the recovery process but quickly disappear, giving way to the harsh reality that it is not worth staying with her. I view this shift as progress because it prompts me to wonder why she, a seemingly normal person raised in a pious Christian family, commits such a reprehensible act, contrary to the very principles and moral boundaries instilled in her from childhood. Tonight was the culmination of events. I followed her to the parking lot, where she stood for a while, then went to the store and returned to the parking lot. Watching from the sidelines, I couldn't help but wonder what was going on. Intuition told me that she was with him, and I decided to investigate further. To my horror, I found her car parked next to his. At the moment of clarifying the situation, I contacted his wife, with whom I had been communicating for the last few days. She invited me to approach them, introduce myself, and take a picture for memory. Following her advice, I asked my wife not to return home that evening and continued on my way home alone. She called me, crying and apologizing. I reluctantly agreed to come and pick up my things, hoping that she would leave for a while. Thus, all the answers were received, and a new chapter in this stormy journey began. But there was an unexpected turn. The DNA test results of my three children remained untouched in the vault where we kept the mail, and anyone could pick them up. I didn't know they'd been there for weeks. I rarely received physical mail, and perhaps the lack of interest made me forget about it. I had the impression that all three children were mine, but to my great surprise, it turned out that my first son was not biologically mine. The revelation hit me with such force that I was completely stunned. I didn't expect such betrayal, realizing that she must have been unfaithful in the first years of our marriage. My heart is irreparably broken, it has shattered into countless pieces. I realize that it is necessary to be honest with your children, even if it means telling heartbreaking news. So, last night, I plucked up the courage and told my son the truth. It was an emotionally intense moment, full of strong hugs and tears. Meanwhile, my future ex-wife was still missing from home after I caught her red-handed in the car with her lover. Although he is not my biological son, I raised him as my own, and he holds a special place in my heart. In his twenties, he grew into a wonderful young man of whom any father could be proud. But he is not yet ready to confront his mother in her actions. It was with a heavy heart that I made the difficult decision to tell my future ex-wife about this news. I called her on the phone and gathered my strength to tell the truth. As expected, she burst into tears and apologized. She wanted to go home, but I firmly advised her to stay where she was for now. Regardless of the DNA results, I reassured myself that he was still my son. Our connection goes beyond genetics. Throughout this ordeal, I never hid my love for the children and reminded them of it every day. Surprisingly, now that the truth has become clear, I feel relieved. The constant worries associated with the role of a marriage detective and concern about her actions are over. This is a new chapter, free from lies and uncertainty. Finally, I can let go of this load and breathe a little easier. Gone are the days when I walked around her on tiptoe, constantly in suspense. It's all over now. My children and I have embarked on the path of recovery, and although it will not be easy, we have found a sense of peace in the midst of chaos. In the coming days, weeks, 
and months, we will undoubtedly experience a variety of emotions, but I see a clear way out of this darkness. Until the most terrible thing happened in our life with the children. Despite the fact that we were all angry at my future ex-wife, we felt real suffering and pain when we learned that she had died in an accident. The brakes on her car failed, and as a result, she crashed into a concrete pillar at high speed. It looked like an accident, but later it turned out from the surveillance cameras that her lover's wife intentionally damaged the brake hoses. When my wife was having fun with her husband at his friend's house, the other wife broke into the garage and committed this crime. Apparently, she couldn't forgive them for this offense. Her involvement in the death of my wife was proved, and a sentence of eight years in prison was imposed. While it remains for us and the children to hold on and support each other in this terrible loss. Oh, man. Oh, man. Unfortunately, it happens in life, but the main thing is to go through it and learn a lesson, gentlemen. Story 2 To find myself in a situation like the one I'm going to tell you about now, when I have to reassess the two people most dear to me, it's really unexpected. This serves as a reminder to everyone that trust can be a complex and unpredictable thing. Snakes often hide among our loved ones, even in our own families. So let's start with the fact that I never believed in love at first sight until Emily appeared in my life. We were colleagues at a fast food restaurant where her captivating blue eyes, piercing smile, and long blonde hair caught my attention. Before meeting Emily, I accepted the laid-back nature of dating culture for a considerable period of time. Unknown girls turned up at my house almost every night, and at first, I thought that this was exactly what I needed. But Emily quickly taught me a valuable lesson. Even without physical contact, from the very beginning, I realized that capturing her attention would not be an easy task. Emily resisted my advances, primarily because she claimed to be well acquainted with people like me. I assumed she thought I was somewhat unpleasant. Despite the limitations of our conversations, which rarely exceeded five minutes, I was determined to prove to her that I was different from other men she encountered. Of course, I had things in common with them, but I sincerely wanted to change. So I devoted several weeks to convincing her of my true uniqueness, for which I had to destroy the false image I had created. Before delving into this story, it should be noted that at that time, I had not yet completed my college studies. During a difficult period of my life, I made the difficult decision to drop out of school, feeling that the whole world conspired against me. This is a familiar story, many people have faced similar problems. I believe that the education system was falsified and unfair, primarily due to the fact that I myself suffered from social anxiety disorder, which made it difficult for me to keep up. Unfortunately, by the time I found a therapist who could help me, I had already made the decision to leave school. As a result, I started working in a fast food restaurant. Feeling that my parents had lost faith in me despite my decision to drop out of school, my parents supported me by agreeing to pay the costs of therapy while I lived in their basement. But I couldn't get out of the shadow of my older brother John, who was a shining star in their eyes. With an office job and an economics degree, he was even preparing to marry his high school sweetheart. Throughout most of my life, I have tried to emulate his success. Despite the failures in my studies, I persistently searched for ways to earn the approval of my parents and convince them of my worthiness with positive actions. I became fixated on proving that I was as capable as my brother John. It consumed me. I was constantly striving to surpass him, although it seemed an insurmountable task. In their eyes, I was considered a loser compared to his achievements. This understanding was the most painful, and every day I spent in the basement, I felt the weight of rejection from my own family. It was very unpleasant to feel like an outcast in a place where unconditional acceptance should have reigned. Life itself began to lose its luster, and simple existence turned into a struggle. In order to overcome Emily's barriers, I realized the need to destroy my own. I started with small gestures of affection, like holding the door open for her and taking orders from clients we both despised to shield her from their dislike. I focused on listening to her sincerely, not letting my careless thoughts get in the way, while maintaining a respectful and attentive demeanor. I noticed that gradually, she began to lose her vigilance and open up to me. Having entered into a relationship with Emily, it was as if I had entered into a completely new sphere, where I was finally able to inhale the refreshing aroma of freedom. I didn't even realize how trapped I was until she let her walls collapse, revealing the incredible person she really is. Every date with her turned into an exciting adventure, 
carefully thought out by our creative spirit. We moved away from the usual and mundane impressions, often discovering hidden pearls that took us to fascinating places. We went on spontaneous trips to neighboring cities in Emily's faithful Toyota. Among our favorite pastimes was visiting amusement parks, despite my paralyzing fear of heights. Emily urged me to climb the roller coaster, and her presence gave me a sense of unshakable strength. With her, I felt invincible, as she constantly reminded me that life was created to enjoy it, regardless of obstacles. She saw untapped potential in me, even in those moments when I hardly realized it myself. When I finally plucked up the courage to share my life story with her, I expected laughter or rejection, but I got something completely unexpected. Despite the fact that this was said in jest, living in my parents' basement and not having a high school diploma could well lead Emily to think that I'm not the ideal partner for her, but it wasn't like that. Emily was sympathetic to my problems because she herself faced similar difficulties in dealing with her own parents. Her parents were tough and domineering, constantly pressuring her to meet their standards. Instead of succumbing to pressure, as I usually did, Emily made a courageous decision to go her own way and live on her own terms despite the modest living conditions in a small apartment next to a diner. Emily skillfully used her space to the maximum. The size of her living space did not matter at all because she turned it into a paradise that seemed exclusively ours. Thanks to her influence, I learned to appreciate seemingly insignificant moments that often fly by unnoticed, and this was one of the many qualities that I admired in her. In her presence, I discovered a sanctuary where I could be truly real, freed from the burden of my parents' expectations and the close attention of others. Therefore, her betrayal was especially difficult to digest. Against my better judgment, I decided to introduce Emily to my parents. The reason for this decision remained unclear to me, since I had long ceased to take into account their opinion. However, some part of me still craved their recognition. Emily was the only semblance of normality and goodness in my life, and I wanted my parents to recognize that. It was on that fateful evening that she ran into everyone, including John. At that very moment, I didn't notice any signs of anxiety. I naively believed that their communication was purely friendly and cordial. After all, his fiancée was present, and it seemed inconceivable to me that there could be some hidden motives behind their newfound friendliness. But from that very evening, I began to notice changes in Emily's behavior. She became more distant, and it seemed that she no longer put so much effort into our relationship. At first, I was hesitant to admit it, fearing that I might seem overly possessive or paranoid. I convinced myself that these fears were just a figment of an overactive imagination, or maybe something was bothering Emily. She had always been my mainstay, my confidant, who might jokingly called my little therapist, but who was there to support her? Unfortunately, I was so forgetful that I couldn't connect all the dots. Not wanting to let our relationship collapse, I tried to be close to her, to provide her with constant support. But my efforts didn't seem to have paid off. Instead of appreciating my presence, Emily began to portray me as too intrusive and intrusive, as if I was getting too deeply into her life. Overnight, Emily stopped participating in her usual activities, such as going to the cinema at her house or going to an amusement park. Our conversations came to nothing, and I found myself in a state of utter panic. It seemed that I was on the verge of losing the only source of happiness in my life, and this thought was simply unbearable. Desperate to save our relationship, I made an impulsive decision to get a second job at a local shoe store. I know it sounds weak, but I sincerely believed that by being able to buy more things for her, I would be able to bring her joy and rekindle the spark between us. I clung to the hope that Emily's gifts would rekindle the fading spark in our relationship. She accepted them with visible pleasure, but unfortunately, they did not improve our relationship in any way. No matter how hard I tried, nothing had a positive effect. Moreover, the more I tried to win her back with gifts, gestures, and sacrifices, the faster her love for me faded. Having decided to save what was left, I decided to surprise Emily one day by giving her some freedom, letting her breathe without feeling suffocated by my presence. I assumed she would want to see me after this separation. There has been some improvement in our conversations, which allowed me to assume that we are gradually restoring our relationship. At least, I convinced myself of this to bring a glimmer of joy to Emily's face. For several weeks, I diligently saved up money to buy the coveted bracelet that she wanted so much, hoping that it would serve as a tangible symbol of my love and devotion. 
The gift was accompanied by a beautiful bouquet of her favorite flowers. I desperately wanted her to appreciate the depth of my affection and how willing I was to invest in our relationship. Now that I think about it, I can't help but shudder at how pathetic and desperate I looked as I approached her house. Every step I took was filled with anticipation, just the thought of seeing her again was pure bliss. It was painful to stay away from her, but today, finally, I would be reunited with her. Armed with a spare key, I cautiously went inside, watching the faint glow of her lanterns coming through the lower part of the door. But as soon as I crossed the threshold, an unexpected sound reached my ears. It was an unusual sound, defying logic. The source of these mysterious sounds came from her living room, unmistakably different from the hum of the TV. The sounds echoed loudly through the room, their clarity and realism were almost tangible. They bounced off the walls, which was disconcerting. Instantly, an anxious feeling appeared, from which the heart began to pound and a knot was tied in the stomach. A wave of indecision swept over me, forcing me to think about whether to go further or retreat. But curiosity got the better of caution and forced me to move stealthily towards the source of the noise, trying not to scare her off. With each step, the intensity of the sounds increased. Hormones permeated the air, causing a sickening feeling in me. When I cautiously peeked around the corner, my world shattered into countless pieces. There, on the very sofa where we spent countless nights of intimacy, there was a sight that tore my heart. Emily, the love of my life, was locked in an intimate embrace with none other than my own brother. I froze in place as if time had stopped, trying to comprehend the betrayal unfolding before my eyes. My mind was racing, desperately trying to find at least some explanation for this inexplicable nightmare. But alas, no arguments could explain the depth of pain and betrayal that gripped me at that moment. It seemed that Emily's betrayal was not only a betrayal of our relationship but also of my very essence. In an unfathomable act of betrayal, my own brother John not only betrayed his fiancée but also entered into a secret relationship with my girlfriend Emily. The pain that gripped me at that moment defied description, as if the very foundation of my world had collapsed in an instant. Emily, whom I once considered the love and inspiration in my life, had now become the catalyst for my emotional destruction. As the room spun around me, the shock gradually passed, replaced by an irresistible surge of anger bubbling in my veins. Feeling the weight of my emotions, I realized that I had to leave this toxic environment before I would commit an act that I would regret later. I silently walked away from this painful scene, and an unbearable pain pierced my heart. How could they both, John and Emily, commit such a deep betrayal towards me? If I've always had a strained relationship with John, the fact that he slept with my girlfriend was a cruel blow. It seemed that he was supposed to triumph in all spheres of life, and I was always left on the sidelines. And Emily, despite everything that connected us, it seemed that the love I once had for her instantly turned into a boiling, absorbing hatred that defied my attempts to stop her rapid fall. When my relationship with John was already destroyed beyond recognition, I was seized with boiling anger. In the days that followed, I gave Emily what she most wanted, distance. Seething with rage, I retreated to the basement, taking a few days off under the guise of sick leave. As I sank into isolation, impulsive thoughts began to creep into my head, threatening to take over common sense. The desire to call John's wife and reveal the truth burned in me. But deep down, I knew that this would not be enough, it would not satisfy the unquenchable thirst for retribution that consumed me. The sudden realization hit me like a lightning bolt. It became clear that I had to make sure that the severity of their actions was felt, so that they faced the consequences face to face. With this new determination, I organized another family dinner, replacing them with it under the pretext of an important message about serious changes in my life. The evening passed, it would seem, in the usual presence of parents, but then they were joined by my seemingly flawless brother, with his unsuspecting bride. His appearance, as if everything was normal, his attempt to strike up a conversation with me fueled endless anger in me. His unflappable behavior, as if his act of sleeping with my girlfriend meant nothing, infuriated me. I tried to take my time, waited for everyone to sit down and enjoy the meal, and only then made my move. But at the moment when I was about to speak, Emily intervened in the conversation, and I could not help noticing her subtle hints, a change in the tone of her voice, the way she laughed at his jokes, the wide smiles that she addressed exclusively to him. It was unbearable. Desperate for attention, I gathered all the attention, pretending that I was finally ready to tell my long-awaited news. 
the audience plunged into expectant silence, intently watching my every word. When all eyes shifted to me, I got up from my seat, clutching a glass of wine in my hand. Having calculated everything to the smallest detail, I turned to my brother, depicting a facade of admiration on my face. I began showering him with words of praise, emphasizing his achievements and expressing deep pride that he tirelessly strives for his desires and always achieves them without much effort. He absorbed every word, enjoying the attention. Deep down, I was burned when I saw his smug grin, as if his superiority remained intact despite my deliberate attempts to elevate him with compliments. Looking at Emily, I noticed a clear glint in her eyes when she looked at my brother. It was such a mesmerizing look, as if he embodied everything she had ever wanted and even more. I gripped the glass tightly, threatening to smash it to pieces under the pressure of anger, but I couldn't bring myself to let it go. A surge of rage coursed through my veins, prompting me to finish my speech as soon as possible. With a forced smile, I raised my glass, congratulating my brother on his illicit affair with my girlfriend. An eerie silence reigned in the room, and all eyes turned to the guilty couple. I felt a surge of adrenaline, my heart began to pound, my hands became wet, but I kept my composure and took a sip of raspberry wine. On the faces of everyone present, except Emily and John, there was an expression of surprise and disbelief. They resembled frightened deer frozen in the headlights. Despite my mother's insistent requests to sit down, I firmly stood my ground, deciding to talk about the events I witnessed in all the details. It was as if I thought that if I had witnessed it, then they deserved to hear about it. And so, I began my narration. I talked tirelessly about exactly where I found them and in what compromising position they were. Despite my parents' and John's fiancé's treaties to sit down, my gaze never left Emily's watery eyes. I couldn't help but think, how dare she shed tears now after the grave act she committed. She had the audacity to sit and pretend to be innocent. John tried to intervene, grabbed my arm, trying to lead me to a chair, but I quickly waved him away. I couldn't hold back my words. I urgently needed to express everything that was boiling in my soul. As a result, a lot of emotions were reflected on the faces of those present, from bewilderment to rage. Emily and John exchanged furtive guilty glances, unable to meet anyone's gaze. I remember how I let out a bitter ironic laugh, intended solely for their benefit, after which I sank into my seat, allowing the scene to unfold in front of me like a cinematic spectacle. I actually destroyed its immaculate facade. My parents, who had always regarded my brother as the epitome of perfection, looked at him with a mixture of bewilderment and disappointment. I enjoyed the moment, rejoicing in the truth that was revealed to them. They were completely unable to muster the courage to deny it. In my unconsciousness, I forgot about John's fiancé for a moment, but she quickly grabbed her glass and threw it at my brother, causing me to burst out laughing as the wine cascaded down his face. Enraged, she ran out of the room, throwing the ring at him. My parents, who have always valued honesty and could never have imagined that their beloved son would turn out to be such a disgusting person, were left perplexed. They reproached him for his complete lack of respect. There was shame and disappointment in their voices, which sent a shiver down my spine. Emily also did not stay away from their attention. Their gazes shifted to her, and they sternly ordered her to leave their house immediately. I didn't look in her direction, I had reached my limit in communicating with her. Even when she tried to apologize to all of us for the horror they had caused, her words flew into one ear and quickly flew out of the other, without having any effect. In truth, part of my heart followed her out the door. When everything was said and done, at that moment, I felt that I had reached the bottom. The consequences could not be avoided either. My parents, although they acknowledged my pain, expressed their disapproval of the way I handled it. They thought my brother's fiancé deserved more than to find out the truth in such a humiliating way. And mostly, I agreed with them. I must admit that I was somewhat self-centered in that situation, but given the enormous pain I experienced and the deep loss I experienced, it was almost impossible for me to consider anyone's point of view. When we went to our bedrooms that evening, a heavy cloud of tension hung over the house. John's worst fear materialized in front of him, my parents looked at him with a mixture of contempt and indifference. And despite the passage of time, we eventually made the difficult decision to kick him out of our house. It became quite clear that for our parents, this situation was much more important than we had initially assumed. I suspect it was caused by a deep affection for his ex-fiancé. 
he humiliated himself to the point that he begged them to change their minds, but they remained adamant in their decision. I couldn't help but sympathize with him, seeing how even his ex fiancee rejected him, denying him the opportunity to explain himself. He was left alone with this ordeal. Speaking of his ex fiancee, she shamelessly exposed him on social media, and many residents of our city joined in the public condemnation. At one time, John became a symbol of shame, the personification of dishonor. As for Emily, from what I've heard, her life has gone into a downward spiral. She quit the burger joint but kept in touch with one of her friends, who turned out to be our work colleague. This friend confided in me, informing me that Emily was facing eviction. It turned out that she owed a significant amount for rent, and the landlord went to court. Being in a noisy trailer park, I made a firm decision to go ahead and look for the same joy that Emily once brought into my life. But this time, I was determined to find it in myself. It may sound sentimental, but I went on a deep journey of self-discovery during which the truth was revealed to me that I deserve much more than what others can offer. That's how I got my destiny back. By a lucky chance, I got a job that not only paid better but also gave me the opportunity to escape from the current life situation. When I really tasted independence for the first time, everything else faded. Here's a lesson I've learned along the way. Never scold yourself for falling in love, and don't turn a blind eye to warning signs. And most importantly, never shift the blame for someone else's infidelity. If you know that you are giving your all, then this is a reflection of their character, not yours. Take this experience as a lesson and be vigilant, even if it's about your own family. You never know a person's true intentions. Under fits of laughter, stretched out on her modest inflatable mattress, she confessed to me her simple desires. She did not aspire to something extravagant and confusing in life, she only wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. And when she had saved enough money, she planned to continue her education. It was she who suddenly started talking about a date, and I could hardly grasp the reality of what was happening. Naturally, I accepted her offer but it was difficult for me to understand that my efforts were noticed and appreciated. It may seem silly, but at that moment, my 21-year-old self was filled with distrust. This experience forced me to adopt a completely new personality, a kind of shield to protect myself from possible rejection or disappointed expressions that sometimes appeared on people's faces when they saw me. I made a firm decision to stop harassing John and the person he represented. Having decided to free myself from their influence, I made a bold choice to completely distance myself from them. Having got a job, I took the first step towards liberation, but it was the meeting with my new friend that really illuminated my further path, opening up a new outlook on life. Thank you.